Thanks for checking out this movie review video. This is for the 1971 film Let's Scare Jessica to Death, which is kind of a weird title if you ask me. I don't really understand. Well, I mean, I kind of understand its relevance within the film, but I kind of feel like maybe we should have gotten a much better title. I don't know. Let me know if you agree or not in the comments. And you can always put whatever comments you want in the comments. We can talk about this film. We can talk about other horror stuff. And also, this is a great time for me to say, hit subscribe to my channel, please. If you like any video I've ever done, that's the best way for you to repay me and say thank you. Uh, quick, painless, costs you nothing. Just do it. Also, hit the notification bell button because then you'll know how many videos I'm putting up each week. Anyway, that out of the way. Let's Scare Jessica to Death, directed by John D. Hancock, who also directed Bang the Drum Slowly, California Dreaming, some of the Twilight Zone episodes, the original, The Girls of Summer as well. That's just some things that he directed. Uh, the film was written by Hancock, as well as Couch uh, Lee Couchim, who also wrote Blood of the Iron Maiden, All in the Family, a bunch of episodes of the show All in the Family, just so you know and something wilder, and the film is supposedly based on the story Carmilla by Sheridan Le Fanu, um, so that would obviously point people in the direction of, oh, it truly is a vampire film. The vampire situation is truly what's going on with the character of Emily in this. Well, maybe, in my opinion, because obviously this is kind of a confusing film. It's kind of a WTF film because there's a lot of wacky stuff going on. You really can't put it all together while you're watching it. I did take a while to think about it after it was done, and I have a theory that I'll tell you at the very end what I think is actually going on, but I could see where people would see it as like an actual, just straight up kind of, you know, vampire film, especially if it is kind of based on the story Carmilla, but, but, even if it's based on Carmilla, it doesn't, it doesn't mean definitely that it is vampire related or that that was the whole crux of the film, because it can just be kind of inspired by it. But anyway, this film is reportedly one of Stephen King's favorite horror films, so for that reason, I definitely wanted to check it out. It's one I've been aware of for quite some time and really wanted to sink my teeth into, pun intended, uh, at some point, so I'm finally getting to it. Jessica's pet in this was actually supposed to be a mole initially, and you'll notice they actually say in the film mole. They call it a mole, but it's obviously, as they show it close up, a field mouse. Um, I think if they were going to use a field mouse, they should have just said mouse. You know, like, don't say mole, but show a close up of a mouse. That's kind of one of the weird things within the film. I'm like, you could have just changed that on the fly pretty easily. Kind of weird that they didn't. Just the thing, uh, yeah. So there are a lot of shots within the film of like the outside of the house that they're in, which looks appropriately creepy. I really like how kind of like dark and creepy it looks. Uh, and there's always like this fog that's kind of around it and over it. Apparently, the first day they showed up to start shooting, that fog was just there. It naturally occurred and they were like, let's get as much footage of this as we can and we'll just pop it in throughout. So all the footage of the outside of the house was shot on the first day to utilize that fog. So almost every time you're seeing the outside of the house, it has fog around it. It's all from that first day, which is kind of an interesting little bit of information. The initial quote about not knowing madness from san uh, sanity by um, Jessica in this film sets the stage for distrust of the perspective of the main character, then she also briefly sees someone in the cemetery, and at that point, you're wondering, is she just seeing that person, or was that person actually there, and then they kind of ran away from when she looked back. So that quote is very key in the, in the beginning, because it really does kind of set the tone for the audience to be like, can I actually trust the perspective of this character? So the whole time, you're kind of like questioning is what she's seeing actually happening, or is this all in her head, or is it kind of like a somewhere in between? Which, I'll give you my theory at the very end, which probably won't guess it. Well, maybe you will, but you probably won't. Could the use of the hearse in the beginning of the film be foreshadowing for the occupants, meaning they are all going to die? Well, that was my thought while I'm watching it for the first time. Obviously, Jessica doesn't end up dying at the end of the, of the events of the film, 
Um, the others do. Uh, I don't know if that was just a foreshadowing piece, but who knows? I will say, based off of this, that all of my notes until the very, very end are kind of based on me watching it for the first time and not thinking backwards at the end. The only thing that's that's me kind of like thinking back on it is, and it, and some random things I'll just kind of like throw in while I'm going through it, but the my final like one or two comments are the ones that are kind of like, in retrospect, I think this film is about this type thing. So the rest of these things are like how I was experiencing the film. The older guy on the ferry seems very weary of the old bishop place when it's brought up. Also, I'm wondering if he was kind of supposed to be a little bit like the ferryman of the River Styx. It's kind of like a thing of like when people die, you know, he's the ferry to kind of take them to, I think, hell. Um, or is that purgatory? I don't know. Not not good on my religion. I'm sorry, people. Really sorry about that. But yeah, the ferryman was pretty creepy. And just notice like how he kind of like pauses and seems to kind of acknowledge that there's something with the Bishop Place. Obviously, the Bishop Place being that house that Jessica and Duncan and Woody had purchased. And I guess are planning on working the land. Although when they first show up, it seems like their plan is just, let's make money by selling things. Let's sell the antiques in this house. And that's how we'll make money. But then Woody goes out and he just is always spraying pesticide on the apples for some reason. So I'm assuming they're working the land. The inner monologue voiceovers for Jessica are good to give her secret thoughts that she's hiding from Woody and Duncan. It's a really good way to like be in her head without tipping her hand too much to Woody and Duncan and Emily uh, at certain points because it lets you know what's going on without the other characters really knowing what's going on within her head. So a lot of times voiceovers don't necessarily work in film, but in this instance, I think that it really does for that reason. It's kind of like just the private moments that only the audience is allowed to, to be a part of. Um, they seem way less concerned than they should be to find a random person who's moved into the house that they just purchased. Yeah, when they show up, Emily's already there. And they kind of seem just like, oh, what are you doing? Oh, you're a squatter? Oh, okay. And then they invite her for dinner, and then they end up letting her just stay. And it's just like, I mean, I understand from the perspective of, like, Woody, who's trying to get it on with her. Like, I get his motivation there. But for Jessica and Duncan, it's like, this is a little too weird, you know? And then, and then things get weird because Emily acts weird, and there are weird things that happen. But... You may be questioning at that point, is this just in Jessica's mind or is this actually happening? Pause for horror hydration. Mm. Great to be hydrated. When Emily talks about hearing things in the house, the music sounds a bit off and Jessica looks a bit concerned. It gives you the idea that what Emily is saying will actually affect her somehow. So that's kind of another one of those, and, and they do this a lot with like these musical cues, especially based around Emily, to kind of be like, something is off with Emily. Something's going on with Emily. She's she's bad. And it puts emphasis on what she's saying or doing at that point. So it gives you the idea that she is going to have some sort of impact on Jessica, whether it's like her mental state or she's actually kind of an evil person or an unstable person or a vampire or whatever, and she's going to be coming after her. So, yeah. Every viewer has to be like, do not do a seance. <laughs> when she's like, let's do a seance, uh, I was immediately like, don't do a seance. Like, this is a terrible idea. But then, obviously, it could open up some doors. But, unfortunately, it doesn't really do anything within the film. At least I don't think. You know, maybe if you have a theory on the seance actually doing something, go ahead. But I think it was just kind of another thing to show the personality of Emily and how kind of macabre she is and how she's very much herself. <laughs> the phrase, we're all kind of want wandering spirits, you know, strikes as being important when Woody says it, especially when Emily says she won't go and the music hits a dark tone at that point. Because Emily says, I will not leave, basically. So you do get a little bit of a feeling that for some reason she's kind of tied to that house. And then much later, you know, Jessica says, oh, you, you know, you look like the person in this photo, like the old photo that's found in the attic. So 
yeah, you get the idea she's tied to the house, but the phrase, we're all kind of wandering spirits, you know, made me think, is this potentially a veiled line of dialogue that's supposed to kind of nod to the viewers and say, all these people actually are dead. They don't actually all exist right now, and this is what we're seeing. So maybe tipping my hand a little bit to what I'm going to talk about at the very end as my overall theory on what's going on. The person Jessica sees in the lake does make for a pretty creepy moment when she was going out swimming and she sees the thing under the water, the person under the water. I think they shot that really well. I think it's very appropriately creepy. The music that went with it had great impact to it, so I love that moment. They play pretty hard at something being off with Emily because of the music that ends up being played when the camera focuses on her many of the times. I kind of already talked about that, but yeah, they go pretty hard at it, which is kind of why I was thinking that it may very well have been like a misdirection thing, especially pairing that with the beginning where, you know, you're getting inside Jessica's head and she's saying, I can't tell what's real and what's not. Like, what's sanity? What's insanity? I don't know, basically. So it's kind of like, What's really going on? There's a lot of confusing stuff thrown. Jessica finds a knife in the attic and the camera focuses on it. Uh, this basically means that it's going to be coming into play later. It does, but I didn't really feel like it came into play as much as maybe it should have. Uh, or in, in a super big way. Like, they, they put enough emphasis on that knife being there and then they're just kind of like... But it could actually tie in a little bit to my theory that I'll tell you at the very end. Sorry, poor hydration. Allergies making me have a really dry throat. I thought Duncan would have followed up saying Emily is attractive with something like, but you're the most beautiful woman I've ever seen, Jess. No, he did not. In the car, when he was like, and she's like, do you, do you, are you attracted to her? And he's just like, yep, that's it. <laughs> no quicker way to get yourself in trouble with your partner then to answer a question like that, like that. Um, so a few things could be going on here. You could say that if you believe that Emily kind of is something else, if she's a vampire or whatever, she's kind of charmed Duncan as well as Woody. Uh, and maybe that's the reason that they're all allowing her to stay at the house in the first place because she's kind of charmed them to a degree. So maybe that's going on or maybe their relationship's just not that strong. Because as we see later, Duncan ends up actually being involved with Emily, as is Emily with Woody. So it's like everyone... And you kind of get the idea that there is a little bit of kind of sexual tension between Jessica and Emily as well. And you get the idea that maybe that is something that Emily was looking for in addition. That maybe she's down to get it on with everyone. I like how Duncan gets bullied by the old men in town. Uh, that's one of the things that just kind of made me laugh. Like, if it was not old men, it would potentially be a little more, like, concerning or, like, you know, dread-filled or something. But it's like these old dudes. Literally, at one point, one of the guys is walking with a walker. And, like, Duncan's getting bullied by these dudes. And it's just like, okay. It's just funny to me. I like that aspect of it. When Sam talks about Abigail Bishop drowning, Sam the antique dealer guy... You think back to what Jessica saw in the lake, because obviously that ties right in. Now the question becomes, did she kind of know what was going on prior to that, and that's why she saw it was all in her head, or was she getting some sort of like psychic vibes and seeing the past, like what's really happening, or is someone else making her see this in essence? This is kind of the confusing, like everything up in the air nature of the film as you're watching it. With how Duncan cuts off Sam when he's talking about Abigail, you can tell he's hyper-protective of Jessica and wants to make sure she doesn't, experiencing, doesn't experience anything potentially disturbing. You can tell he feels like she's fragile, and with her inner monologue that you're hearing is voiced over, she is saying that she's basically feeling kind of fragile, like she could kind of fracture at any point mentally, but you see that Duncan's very concerned about that. And at one point, he even says something about, like, we should go back to New York, I believe. Because I don't... Where are they? Are they in California at this point? I can't remember. Or maybe just different part of New York. I don't know. 
Um, when the girl leads Jessica to the body of Sam, it leads to the breakthrough moment of finding out the girl isn't in Jessica's mind, so she can be believed by the viewers at this point, at least maybe slightly. Because it, up until that point, you're like, oh, maybe this girl she's seeing is just in her head. But then Duncan sees her and acknowledges her and interacts with, with her, and then Woody shows up, and he is also interacting with her. But also note that this girl takes off as soon as Carmilla shows up, also note that this girl had her neck wrapped, which some other people do in town, and they kind of allude to the idea. I think th there are actually some comments by some characters about, like, vampires, vampirism, like, people covering up, like, bite marks on their neck. Although later we see that it's not really bite marks, it's actually, like, a line, which would be something caused by a knife, a knife that was found in the house. Now, you could say that maybe this is just kind of a different take on vampirism, and she, uh, Emily, doesn't actually have fangs. She just uses a knife to, like, you know, cut people a lot of times and then drinks the blood. Just throwing out some theories there. Not 100% on it. It's a confusing film. You get the idea it's no coincidence that the girl runs when Emily shows up. Yes, what I was saying. Um, so pointing further at something being up with Emily. Jessica's greatest fear materializes when Duncan says maybe she should go back to New York to get some more help. That's the thing she's been trying to avoid this entire film. That's her inner thoughts just saying, I have to appear to be better. Basically, I can't let them know how I'm feeling. Like, she's trying to hide how fragile mentally she is. But it also seems that Duncan's picking up on it. Like, she can't hide it. And her fears become very much realized once he kind of makes that comment. She's like, ugh. It does seem like a stretch to suggest that whomever killed Sam killed the mole. The mole. <laughs> I mean, how do you make that connection, really? Seems like a convenience out of writing type thing. Didn't really make sense. Didn't really make sense. When Jessica and Emily are going to the lake, it looks like Emily is wearing a shirt that looks a lot like the one that Sam was wearing when he was found dead. Just an observation. Don't know if that necessarily means anything. Maybe it just kind of looked like it to me, or maybe it was the same shirt, and that's the director kind of nodding to the audience saying she had something to do with Sam dying. He actually did die, because now she's wearing a shirt. I don't know if I'm the only one who felt like they saw that, but you can put it in the comments. Uh, note that a lot of the creepy things that happened with Emily would seem totally different if you change the music that makes it seem creepy. A lot of it's like how they focus on her and the music that they play is what drives a lot of like the she's creepy, there's something off, off with her vibe. So if you literally, if you just do the mental exercise of changing that music in your head, she could seem totally benign. And this is one of like the, the things about pointing out the importance of music in film. It really can take scenes and make them totally different in context. So just saying. The voices in Jessica's head saying, I'm still here, and you want to die, seem like they could be her since she was experiencing them in the beginning of the film, so they already laid that groundwork, but they also seem like they could be Emily since they made it appear that Emily was kind of telepathically speaking to her at another point in the film. So once again, like not moving you one way or the other necessarily, but having kind of two potential ideas that make sense within the film. Again, this is why it's kind of confusing. Woody ends up being a lot more observant than you'd think, uh, but it doesn't actually amount to much since he just keeps trying to get in Emily's pants. But that could be another indicator to the charm aspect of Emily potentially pointing to her being vampiric. Don't know. Potential other idea here. When everyone in town has the scratches, that's when it's like, what's going on? Like, obviously, towards the end, everything just feels like it starts falling, like, rolling downhill. And and things get faster, and things get crazier, and, you like, you get more confused. Like, I did. I'm just like, what is going on? I'm trying to come up with, like, a real reason to, like, what's going on. And it just gets confusing because of the things they keep throwing out. Seem, you know, connected to the story, but, like, also a little bit nonsensical with what's going on. Horror hydration. Crazy. The ending becomes kind of confusing, but compelling, because you want to know what's ultimately at play. Yes, obviously, you want to solve 
this gigantic puzzle you've been watching. Still confused at the end, uh, did she imagine all of it, or was something actually going on? I'm sure a lot of people felt this when they watched it. But that's why I, I like the film, because it I like films that make me think. That films that I can tell there's a lot more going on there that was intentional, and they want you to kind of pick it apart more. They want you to find these little clues and kind of piece the puzzle together. So I like that. Um, I do think ultimately the ambiguity of the film is important because it makes the viewer feel confused just like Jessica. Therefore, helping you understand how it actually feels for her to be mentally fractured the way she kind of conveys within the film. So I think it's kind of genius in a sense that like it's so confusing and it's so crazy that it puts you in the mindset that Jessica is in within the film of she's confused and she's like, am I going crazy? I can't figure out if this is real or not real. As a viewer, you can't figure out if it's real or not real. So I think it's kind of brilliant in that sense. It's really good filmmaking. Here we go. In the end, I think it was all in her head to a degree. To a degree, it was all in Jessica's head. Based on her being transported in the back of a hearse in the beginning and immediately going to the cemetery, I take it as a sign that she was dead this whole time. And based on the voices she hears saying she wants to die, she committed suicide. So the events of the film are actually her in purgatory. And it would also make sense then why the knife shows up, and it would also make sense why when you see everyone in town eventually, they have these knife scratches because it's kind of mirroring how she killed herself with that knife. And everything's in her head. It's, this is all like purgatory, basically, because she killed herself at the Institute. Also notice that the guy that she like stabs to death with like the fish fishing gaff at the end when she's in the boat has a white lab coat on like he would be working at the mental health institute institution that she was at. So that kind of potentially being a clue to where she actually was. So you could look at that as like, this is all in her head, it's a psychotic break, and she's trying to run away from the mental institution. But I took it more as she was at the institution, she killed herself, and now she's in purgatory, especially hence being transported in the very end, in, in the very beginning, in the back of the hearse, going to the cemetery, and then being ferried to an island like the ferryman of the sticks, of River Styx. Like, I felt like it fits really well. Now, whether that's actually what was supposed to be a play or not, I don't know, but give me your theories. Just saying. This theory would also explain why it looks like everyone has knife cuts, because she's seeing them on, how she, on everyone, because that's how she killed herself. Already said that. Also, Emily, in this instance, would represent the uninvited guest in her head who drives her over the edge. Basically thinking if this is like an all in her head or this is like a purgatory thing, Emily is actually the part of her mind that drove her to kill herself. Because Emily is coming at her. Emily is the, the destructive portion of what's going on and seems to be coming at her and seems to be telepathically in her head and potentially saying things like I'm not leaving and you want to die like she's willing her to kill herself like she's that part of her mind that is suicidal so those are my theories on the film that's all I have to say about it I really did enjoy it out of five stars with half stars in play I would give it a very good four star rating I did like it but would love to hear other people's opinions on this also you know what do you think of my theory are you on board with it are you not and what are your theories? Because there's a lot of interpretation to be made with this film, I feel like. But go ahead and put it in the comments. Um, and like I said, subscribe to my channel. Hit the notification bell button. I would appreciate all that stuff. I always do. Uh, but until next time, oh, thank you for, for watching this video. I always want to thank people for watching it. Thank you very much for taking your time to watch this. And until next time, keep it brutal.